Cuchulain, the hero of Ulster. In terms of comparative mythology, he is a confusing figure and is often merely assimilated to Lu or seen as partially similar to Indra. But this is never satisfying or anything close to complete. The result is that most commentators do not think Cuchulain even has a direct one-to-one -one equivalent in other branches. But this couldn't be further from the truth. As usual, understanding the mythic material more thoroughly reveals a one-to-one -one parallel in other mythologies. Once you have the right lens, the incarnated deity Cuchulain opens up to you in ways you could never have imagined. When all of the evidence is laid out and examined, only one conclusion becomes apparent. Cuchulain is none other than the Gaelic version of the terrifying wolf of Norse myth, Fenrir. They come from a shared root. Let's take a look. I'll give you the core of the parallel at the beginning and flesh out the details after. Fenrir is the terrifying wolf with the wide jaws. He is described as hungry for fame. The gods fear he will kill them. They place three successive bindings around him to contain and neutralize him. He breaks out of the first two, and the third one successfully neutralizes and restrains him. In an automatic reaction, he bites off the hand of Tyr at the moment he is bound and neutralized. He is then chained to a stone and left there in Snorri's version. Cuchulain does essentially all of this too. He is named Hound and transforms into a terrifying animalistic shape with a stretched open mouth. He is depicted as eager for fame and glory. At one point, the king and his people fear he will kill them due to his battle rage. So they place him in three successive vats of cold water to cool and neutralize him. He bursts through, or boils, the first two, and the third one successfully cools and neutralizes his rage. Just as with Fenrir, the first two bindings are burst through by Fenrir, and the third and final one holds him fast. With Cuchulain, he bursts through, or boils, the first two vats of cold water intended to neutralize him, and the third and final one finally cools and neutralizes him. Much later, he finds himself wounded in battle, so he binds himself to a standing stone. Lugith, his opponent, then cuts off his head, and at the moment he is thus neutralized, his sword drops and cuts off the hand of Lugith in an automatic reaction. Thus, right when he is bound and neutralized on the stone, he reactively cuts off the hand of his opponent, who is precisely the Tyr god type, the Mitra god type, that is, Lugith slash Lu. In summary, we have a canine figure, restrained and made docile by three successive containments, who then severs the hand of the Mitra-type god at the moment he is neutralized and tied to a stone. This parallel is already as clear as any in comparative mythology, with uncanny and carefully patterned details, but there is still another clinching piece that essentially no one is aware of. Cuchulain has been beheaded and bound to a stone, while Fenrir has only been immobilized and chained to a stone, and is prophesied to one day break free and wreak havoc. What people don't realize is that Cuchulain reincarnates into a rampaging beast, who is then killed in precisely the same manner that Fenrir is. This beast is a boar rather than a wolf, called the Boar of Formile, F-O-R-M-A-E-L, but this change doesn't negate the rest of this extensive parallel. As Fenrir is killed by the son of Odin, placing his foot on the lower jaw of the wolf and stretching apart his upper jaw with his hands and apparently stabbing him in the heart through his mouth, so in like manner, the boar of Formile is killed by the grandson of Odin's parallel, Fion placing his knee on the lower jaw of the boar and stretching apart his upper jaw with his hands while his men pull his entrails out. Quote, Oscar, the grandson of Fion, stretched his mighty stout arms across the pig from below and gave it a fierce sudden twist so that he brought the mane of its back to the ground. 
He thrust his knee into it below, his hands seizing its jaw and palate above, so that in that manner the bands of warriors of the Fian pulled its entrails and bowels out behind." Unquote. Fenrir has just killed Odin in his story when he is killed in like manner, while the appearance of the boar instead is said to be the omen that Fion will soon die, and he dies at the end of this very story. So the rampaging beast is closely tied to the death of Odin and his parallel Fion in both cases. This is the same scene in its essentials. And we know that the boar is a reincarnation of Cuchulain because the boar is described with an extremely unique poetic description that is only ever used to describe Cuchulain. Of Cuchulain in his battle frenzy, it is said, quote, The hair of his head, twisted like the tangle of a red thorn bush, stuck in a gap. If a royal apple tree, with all its kingly fruit, were shaken above him, scarce an apple would reach the ground, but each would be spiked on a bristle of his hair as it stood up on his scalp with rage." Unquote. Of the boar of four mile, quote, And it raised the mane of its back on high, so that a plump, wild apple would have stuck on each of its rough, horrid bristles. Unquote. It would take a mental gymnastic feat greater than Cuchulain's twisting fit to believe this is a coincidence, given all of the other parallels I have presented. This is otherwise Cuchulain's unique poetic descriptor, the apples falling on the bristles of his hair and sticking, appearing nowhere else, and the poet is clearly winking at us here to give us a clue regarding who the boar really is. This description is a surviving trace from the mythos this boar originated from. Thus, the boar of Formile is really Cuchulain reincarnated, and he dies in the same way that Fenrir does, completing the parallel to a T. The other way to think of this would be that Cuchulain is the incarnation of a god. Specifically, this god is called Nate, N-E-I-T, or N-E-T, as I've shown in my book and the boar of Formile is another incarnation of that same god. As such, every piece of Fenrir's mythos is paralleled by Cuchulain and his alternate form, the boar of Formile, when these pieces are put together. I had no particular goal of putting a positive spin on Fenrir, or of making an edgy or shocking parallel for the sake of it. I had no affection for Fenrir and assumed, like most people, that he was a pure force of destruction only, a being never intended to be worshipped or revered. Due to what I found when I actually looked deeper, some people want to slander me as evil for presenting evidence and being thorough. As with all of my work, I simply follow the evidence where it leads, and it seems I am less easily satisfied than many other comparative mythologists. I follow the evidence all the way and don't stop halfway. If a parallel is true, it shouldn't make us uncomfortable. We have to be a little more sturdy than that. This is a matter of the facts and the evidence, not of what anyone feels. Regardless of what perspective you approach it from, mythology is not about what we want it to be or how the facts of the matter make us feel. Cuchulain is Fenrir, and this revelation is an invitation to understand more deeply what the meaning was behind these myths, how these figures were treated in the deeper past that underlies the stories that have come down to us. What this parallel suggests is that Fenrir is a narrowed-down depiction of what was originally a more ambivalent deity type one with both beneficent and destructive sides. Cuchulain preserved both the beneficent and destructive sides of this deity type, while Fenrir only preserved the destructive side. When the positive tales of this deity were forgotten or repressed in the Norse tradition, the remaining image was one of almost pure destruction, Fenrir. This process of narrowing down had the effect of something close to a demonization, even if some people of that time probably still could understand the esoteric significance of the wolf, the symbol of the often frightening Mannerbund itself, and connected to Odin. I will explain the complex Vedic and Indo-European deity type that harmoniously puts into context 
both the destroyer and the protector sides of this original deity that Cuchulain and Fenrir derive from later in the video. This parallel between Cuchulain and Fenrir is also another incredibly clarifying piece of evidence supporting the case that Fionn is Odin and Lu is Tyr, as Fionn is in the very position of Odin in the Boar of Four Mile story, and Lugith is in the very position of Tyr in the death of Cuchulain. The Boar's arrival is the omen of Fionn's death, as Fenrir is the agent of Odin's, and then Fionn's grandson kills the boar in the manner that Odin's son kills Fenrir. Meanwhile, Lugith has his hand severed by the hound Cuchulain at the moment he neutralizes him bound to the pillar, clearly the position equivalent to Tyr. Lugith is here in the position of Tyr. The understanding of this parallel pushes aside the arm severing of Nuada as the possible Tyr myth parallel. Simply put, Lugith's hand severing by the hound Cuchulain is far more precisely matched to the severing of Tyr's hand by the wolf Fenrir, including uncanny details. When examined closely, the severing of Nuada's arm by Sreng has no specific details aligning it with the severing of Tyr's hand. Nuada simply loses his arm in a battle, and Sreng has nothing marking him as a canine or in any other way aligned with Fenrir. Sreng is not bound as Fenrir and also Cuchulain are, let alone bound to a stone, and the severing of Nuada's hand does not happen as an automatic reaction to being neutralized as with the severing of Lugith and Tyr's hands. It is also very clearly stated in the first battle of Moitura that Nuada lost his arm at the shoulder, while Tyr lost his hand at the wrist or wolf joint, and Lugith likewise has only his hand severed per the text of the death of Cuchulain, which is the only thing that really makes sense due to how Cuchulain's sword would have had to fall to sever it. It's very unlikely it could have caught him much higher up than the wrist. Even Georges Dumézil, who at first argued that the severing of Nuada's arm was the match for the severing of Tyr's hand, later recanted this position and stated that the parallel was not strong enough and that Nuada's arm severing didn't carry the same functional meaning within the myth that Tyr's hand severing did. As Wouter W. Bellier explains, quote, Finally, in 1977, Nuada is also removed from Dumasil's list of one-handed figures, unquote. From Bellier, Decayed Gods, page 153. Scholar Garrett Olmsted summarizes, quote, With little else upon which to build his case, Dumasil himself, in Dumasil 1974, page 21, and Dumasil 1977, page 199, later recanted his suggestion that Lu and Nuada were the Irish correlatives of Vedic Varuna and Mitra. Olmsted then concludes that, quote, Dumasil was entirely correct in recanting his earlier suggestion that Lu should be a correlative of Varuna and Odin. Indeed, here we shall examine evidence that Lu actually corresponds to Mitra and Tyr, unquote. From Olmsted, Gods of the Celts and the Indo-Europeans, page 90. As I've said many times, the vague similarity of Nuada's arm severing to the severing of Tyr's hand is one of the greatest red herrings in Gaelic comparative myth, or in any comparative myth. It keeps misleading many who are too superficial in their reading, as it also misled me for a long time. Now that we have a much clearer parallel in the severing of Lugith's hand, we don't have to fall into this trap any longer. With both Lu and Tyr being the Mitraic gods, as I've shown in my articles and my book, and Cuchulain and Fenrir being bound canines, all the pieces finally fall into place. Now that the quick summary is out of the way, let's go more deeply into the details of the textual evidence for this parallel as I've outlined it. Cuchulain's name is literally Hound of Cullen, Ku meaning hound, and he takes the place of the fearsome guard hound of the smith Cullen after killing it, in this way becoming identified with the hound quite explicitly. He is now the hound of Cullen. Quote, 
Myself will be the hound to protect his flocks and his cattle and his land and even himself in the meanwhile. And I will safeguard the whole plain of Mirthevnia, and no one will carry off flock nor herd without that I know of it. Unquote. From the Tanbokulnya, section 7a. Thus Kuhulan is the hound, while Fenrir is the wolf. But the word Ku, of course, can even mean wolf, since hounds and wolves were given interchangeable nomenclature. Kuhulan is known for his warrior frenzy, or warp spasm which has been compared to a werewolf or Incredible Hulk transformation, during which he becomes a terrible monster with some nearly indescribable Lovecraftian animal form. This excerpt is from the Kinsella and the Dunn translations combined. Quote, The first warp spasm seized Cuchulain and made him into a monstrous thing, hideous and shapeless, unheard of. His flesh trembled about him like a pole against the torrent, or like a bulrush against the stream. Every member and every joint, and every point and every knuckle of him, from crown to ground, he made a mad whirling feat of his body within his hide. His feet and shins switched to the rear, and his heels and calves switched to the front. On his head, the temple sinews stretched to the nape of his neck, each mighty, immense, measureless knob as big as the head of a month-old child. He sucked one eye so deep into his head that a wild crane couldn't probe it onto his cheek out of the depths of his skull. The other eye fell out along his cheek." Unquote. In this form, his wide jaws are described, so wide or stretched, apparently, that his cheeks stretch and his organs are visible in his mouth and throat. His wide jaws were one of the first things that made me consider a parallel to Fenrir. Fire also flashes from his nostrils as fire also flashes from Cuchulain's gullet. Quote, his mouth was distorted monstrously. He drew the cheek from the jawbone so that the interior of his throat was to be seen. His lungs and his liver stood out so that they fluttered in his mouth and his gullet. He struck a mad lion's blow with the upper jaw on its fellow, so that as large as a weather's fleece of a three-year-old was each red fiery flake which his teeth forced into his mouth from his gullet. There was heard the loud clap of his heart against his breast, like the yelp of a howling bloodhound, or like a lion going among bears. There were seen the torches of the bive, and the rain clouds of poison, and the sparks of glowing red fire blazing and flashing in hazes and mists over his head with the seething of the truly wild wrath that rose up above him. The hair of his head twisted like the tangle of a red thorn bush stuck in a gap. If a royal apple tree with all its kingly fruit were shaken above him, scarce an apple would reach the ground, but each would be spiked on a bristle of his hair as it stood up on his scalp with rage." Unquote. Note specifically how Cuchulain is compared to a lion at two separate points in this description, his jaw striking a mad lion's blow, and also his heart going against his breast like to a lion going among bears. We will see later that he indeed parallels a Vedic figure with a terrifying lion form. Keep this terrifying form in mind, as this is your Gaelic Fenrir, and there is no other, outside of the other rampaging animal form that Cuchulain incarnates into later, the boar of Formile. Fenrir's wide mouth and fiery nostrils are described by Snorri thus, reminding us of this description of Cuchulain. Quote, The Fenris wolf advances with wide open mouth. The upper jaw reaches to heaven, and the lower jaw is on earth. He would open it still wider had he room. Fire flashes from his eyes and nostrils." Unquote. One of Cuchulain's characteristic traits is that he is hungry for glory and fame, and famously chooses glory and a short life when the druid Kaviv prophesies in this regard. While on the Norse side, Fenrir's primary epithet is Hrothersvidner, which means fame wolf. From the Tanbokulnya we read, quote, Then spoke Kavath, 
The little boy that takes arms this day shall be splendid and renowned for deeds of arms above the youths of Aaron, and the tales of his high deeds shall be told forever, but he shall be short-lived and fleeting. Cuchulain overheard what he said, though far off at his playfeats, southwest of Evin, and he threw away all his playthings and hastened to Conquivar's sleep room to ask for arms. Cuchulain tells Conquivar of Kavad's prophecy. His pupil asked him what luck might lie in the day, and he said, The youth that took arms on this day would be illustrious and famous, that his name would be over the men of Aaron forever, and that no evil result would be on him thereafter, except that he would be fleeting and short-lived. To the south of Evin I heard him, and then I came to thee. That I avow to be true, spoke Kavith. Good indeed is the day, glorious and renowned shalt thou be, the one that taketh arms, yet passing and short-lived. Noble the gift, cried Cuchulain. Little it wrecks me, though I should be but one day and one night in the world, if only the fame of me and of my deeds live after me. Unquote. This motif repeats again right afterward, when Kavid prophesies that whoever mounts a chariot on this day will receive fame and renown forever. And Cuchulain eagerly takes this challenge and mounts his chariot. Fenrir also displays his desire for fame in Snorri's version of his binding. Quote, the wolf thought that this fetter was indeed very strong, but also that his strength had increased since he broke Lading, the first binding. He also took into consideration that it was necessary to expose oneself to some danger if he desired to become famous, so he let them put the fetter on him. Unquote. When they bring the final fetter, Gleipnir, to put on him, he says, quote, it seems to me that I will get no fame, though I break asunder so slender a thread as this is." Unquote. Thus, clearly Fenrir the Fame Wolf is motivated by a pursuit of fame, even though it puts him in danger, just like with Cuchulain. Indeed, hunger for fame is almost the only actual character trait we know of Fenrir, and certainly one of the most prominent ones of Cuchulain. Now, like Fenrir, the people fear Cuchulain will kill friend and foe, and for this reason they come to a point where they have to neutralize him to bring him within the bounds of society. Quoting from the Tanbukulnya, quote, Thereupon they went on till bravely, boldly, battle victoriously, boastingly, blade-redded, they reached the fair plain of Evin. It was then Lavarkam, the watch in Evin Maha, came forth and discerned them. She, the daughter of Ear and of Horn, and she hastened to Konkavar's house. Her eyes restless in her head, and her tongue faltering in her jaw. A single chariot fighter is here, coming towards Evin Maha, cried Lavarkam, and his coming is fearful. The heads of his foes all red in his chariot with him. Beautiful, all white birds he has hovering around in the chariot. With him are wild, untamed deer, bound and fettered, shackled and pinioned. And I give my word, if he be not attended to this night, blood will flow over Konkavar's province by him, and the youths of Ulster will fall by his hand. As an aside, this parallels the prophecy that Fenrir will kill all of the gods. We know him, that chariot fighter, spake Konkavar. Belike it is the little Gila, my sister's son, who went to the edge of the marches at the beginning of the day, who has reddened his hands and is still unsated of combat, and unless he be attended to, all the youths of Evin will fall by his hand. Soon he turned the left side of his chariot toward Evin, and this was Geish for Evin. And Cuchulain cried, I swear by the god, by whom the Ulstermen swear, if a man be not found to engage with me, I will spill the blood of everyone in the dun. And this was the counsel they agreed to follow, to let out the womenfolk to meet the youth, namely thrice fifty women, even ten and seven score, bold, stark naked women, at one and the same time, and their chieftainess, Skanlach, the wanton, before them, to discover their persons and their shame to him. 
Let the young women go, said Conquivar, and bear their paps and their breasts and their swelling bosoms, and if he be a true warrior, he will not withstand being bound, and he shall be placed in a vat of cold water until his anger go from him. Thereupon the young women all arose and marched out, and these are the names of those queens, etc., etc. And they discovered their nakedness and all their shame to him. These are the warriors that will meet thee today, quoth Muggin, the wife of Conquivar, son of Ness. The lad hid his face from them and turned his gaze on the chariot, that he might not see the nakedness or the shame of the women. Then the lad was lifted out of the chariot. He was placed in three vats of cold water to extinguish his wrath, and the first vat into which he was put burst its staves and its hoops like the cracking of nuts around him. The next vat into which he went boiled with bubbles as big as fists therefrom. The third vat into which he went, some men might endure it, and others might not. Then the boy's wrath went down. Thereupon he came out, and his festive garments were put on him by Muggin the queen. His comeliness appeared on him, and he made a crimson wheel-ball of himself from his crown to the ground. A shout was raised at the bluish-purple about him. Beautiful then was the lad that was raised up in view. Two hard five-pointed spears in his hand, a diadem of gold round his head, and the lad was seated between the two feet of Conquivar, and that was his couch ever after, and the king began to stroke his close shorn hair." Unquote. From chapter 7b of the Tanbukulnya. And this final scene shows Cúchalin tamed like some sort of pet sitting at the feet of the king. So, much like with Fenrir, they try to restrain him using three successive containments. He either bursts out of or boils and then escapes from the first two, and the last one finally pacifies and neutralizes him. He is then seated at the foot of the king like a tamed pet, while the king strokes his hair. Later, Cúchalin is mortally wounded in battle, so he binds himself to a standing stone as Fenrir is chained to a stone in the prose Edda version of his myth. At the moment Cúchalin is neutralized by beheading, he cuts off the hand of his opponent in an automatic reaction by dropping his sword on his opponent's wrist. That opponent, of course, is the tear slash mitra type figure Lugith, a legendary version of Lu. Note that Lu Laufada is indeed sometimes called Lugith Laufada as in the folk variant of the Battle of Moitura tale cited in William Copeland Borlase's The Dolmens of Ireland, page 807, where Gaul is said to be the main opponent of Lugith Laufada. In a version of the Battle of Knuha, published in 1901 in this publication, but recorded about 1850 in Meath, we also have Lugith Laufada, as the name of the one fighting Gaul and putting out his eye, Lugith. So the name Lugith is indeed sometimes interchangeable with Lu. As already quoted, Cúchalin reincarnates into a rampaging boar. This boar is killed by Oscar, grandson of Odin, by placing his knee on its bottom jaw and stretching his upper jaw wide. And this boar is connected with the death of Fionn as the omen of his death. Why, then, is Cúchalin a boar, despite being named Hound, while Fenrir is a wolf? And what is this underlying Indo-European deity who would give rise to both Fenrir and Cúchalin? This is clearly explained by only one god type, a god which has avatars of boar, wolf, and lion. Thus, these forms could be switched around in their positions in different branches, or different tales of the same deity, while still coming from the same root mythos. The boar form of Cúchalin can appear in the same mythic spot as Fenrir, and they can still be the same god. The first source of confusion regarding which Vedic god Cúchalin parallels lies in the modern-day presentation of the Vedic god Vishnu, as either an androgynous embodiment of childlike kindness or an uncanny and distant cosmic entity who it is difficult to get a feel for. But this is not necessarily what the god Vishnu was like in the Vedas, or what his type was like in Proto-Indo-European times, 
let alone how this god type was treated in the European branches. We have to peel back the layers here and try to see what Proto-Indo-European Vishnu would have been like. Indeed, what we find is that the Vishnu type explains essentially every single aspect of both Kuhulan and Fenrir, and clarifies why and how these two figures developed in different ways from one original shared mythos. If we are slack at this point and continue misunderstanding Vishnu and the Vishnu type, we will never understand the roles of Kuhulan and Fenrir, and how they can be connected, and what the underlying theology of this particular role is that of the terrifying bound canine who reactively severs the hand of the Mitra-type god and in a violent rampage threatens the gods and omens the end time. Stay tuned for my video on Vishnu to see how exactly both Kuhulan and Fenrir correspond to this god type. Please check out my Patreon if you would like to support the channel and see all of the important topics I have in mind get made into videos as well as supporting the completion of my second book, Breokan's Tower, in which many mysteries will be solved. My book, Taliesin's Map, is available from Amazon. Link in the description. Make sure to like and subscribe for more, as we map the myths.